Well, Olivia, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the political editor of The Guardian, Pippa Creera, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Welcome to both of you. As ever, to the front pages, first of all, starting with the Metro. On their front page, as you can see, Concrete Bungle. They lead with the Education Secretary's off-camera rant. The Financial Times is also leading with the latest on schools, with the headline Crumbling Schools Crisis put Sunak on the back foot as two by-elections loom. Same story for The Guardian, which says the Prime Minister faces claims that he failed to grasp the gravity of the situation while he was Chancellor. While the Yorkshire Post reports that hundreds more schools could be at risk of closing. Daily Express leads with hopes for a weight loss jab which could save lives and cut down the NHS's 6.5 billion yearly obesity bill. Labour's front bench reshuffle sees Blairites call to the top team and figures of the left demoted, that's the lead for the eye. Could Dracula be vegan? That's what the Daily Star has on its front page. And City AM splashes with an interview with the former Bank of England economist Andy Haldane, who's blamed the bank's quantitative easing policy for fueling inflation. Uh, that is based on an interview that will air on Sky's Politics Hub tomorrow evening. So let's get the thoughts then of Pippa and Harry and plenty to talk about first day back at Westminster. Harry, why don't you kick it off? Um, what a day for Sunak and Keegan. Keegan saying, why don't you thank me? And uh, Sunak saying, don't blame me. So where does it leave us? <laughs> what a day. Yeah, first day back from the holidays. Um, definitely didn't go cold turkey today. It was, um, yeah, one of the stranger um, morning rounds of, 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 I've ever seen a minister do. It actually wasn't until a few hours after the, the sort of the round ended that we saw the behind the scenes footage that um, ITV got hold of where um, Keegan sort of let rip at Dan Hewitt, a, uh, a fairly mild mannered man to anyone that's ever met him and certainly not a, a sort of agitating uh, wind-up merchant like some interviewers uh, can be. Um, ironically, actually, Sunak was probably in a bit more difficulty this morning than he was this tonight. Keegan's um, outburst and ap apology and then subsequent admission that she was actually at her dad's birthday party uh, while, while all this was kicking off and couldn't get home because of air traffic control and all the other fuel she's poured on this fire has actually distracted from a quite a serious allegation made by a very former, uh, former, very senior civil servant at the Department of Education, that actually Rishi Sunak's treasury in 2020 and 2021 were behind, directly behind a slashing of, of, of funding for uh, for school repairs. Now, number ten, are quibbling with those figures, they're disputing it. Sunak came out and said, actually, no, that's wrong. I did X, Y, and Z else to to tackle this problem. But actually, Keegan's sort of implosion. Um, actually sort of distracted from taking a bit of the heat of number 10. Now, it's not in any way a good day for the Tories. Um, I think as the Daily Mail say tomorrow, the sort of scandal turns into a farce. And that's never good when, you know, people are sort of laughing at you. It's, um, that's even worse than, uh, than than anything else. As sort of Liz Truss found out last year. Now, the problem is, is that this isn't going to go away overnight. And it seems that every day that comes, there is more anger. And I don't think the government really can afford to have many more days like today. Um, and, um, you know, we're still a year out from the election. Yes, The Guardian uh, picturing um, the woman at the centre of all of this as well, the Education Secretary, Pippa. I mean, you're not... Nobody's sort of suggesting that a dead cat was thrown to take the heat off the PM and this was all deliberate, are they? No, I don't think so. I think William Keegan has a reputation for being fairly um, straight-talking. Uh, that often comes across in interviews. In this case, it obviously came across at the end of an interview. Uh, so I think she was she was sort of you know speaking from the heart. However, uh, it may be a distraction, as Harry says, for one day. It may uh, have meant that uh, Rishi Sunak's first day back to Parliament is uh, it was less uh, dramatic than it might otherwise have been for him personally. But uh, this this is a crisis which is set to rumble on. So actually, it only just buys him a very short amount of time. The focus, as we have um, put on the front page of the Guardian. The, uh, tomorrow is now uh, very much on Rishi Sunak and the decisions he made when he was Chancellor. Uh, the fact that the Department for Education had asked for three or four hundred uh, schools a year to be upgraded. They'd always expect there to be a lower number, but what they hadn't expected is that the hundred 
level, which apparently was the ambition, would be halved by Sunak when he was Chancellor, even though the Treasury had been warned of the potentially lethal implications of school buildings collapsing. We've seen a very small number of those happening um, already. There was one in, um, I think it was last year, in southeast London, near where I live, where children ended up in hospital. Uh, and actually, it, you know, this, this is a crisis which could be so much worse were it to have been it to have arisen as a result of a, a catastrophic incident in a school where more children were seriously injured or indeed or indeed uh, even even killed, and I know that there will be thousands of parents across the country who take not that much comfort uh, today from the government saying to them, "Oh, it's only going to be hundreds of schools, not thousands." I mean, that could be that could still be 999 schools. Um, with thousands of pupils in each of them, built of concrete from the 50s onwards, who will be sitting here not having had confirmation from their own schools yet because some of those haven't replied to the government survey and waiting to see whether their children's education is going to be interrupted again. That might be in a very minor way by moving to porter cabins in, on the school premises, or it might be the whole school getting shut down and having to be bust elsewhere. But any parent waiting to hear that news from their own school now, uh, after the few years that we've had with um, with the interruptions to education as a result of the of the pandemic, will be willing the government to get a grip of it on it and asking the questions why Rishi Sunak as Chancellor decided that he would stick with 50 upgrades a year rather than doing what the Department for Education officials said and stress and stress the urgency of um, and doing more so that we weren't in this position today. Yes, and lots of people reacting to Rishi Sunak saying 95% of schools are fine um, on social media, pointing out that that means one in 20 could crush a child. Um, so that was one issue for him. Yorkshire Post is again going on that prime ministerial denial that he cut funding for school buildings, for school rebuilding. He said, didn't he, that the 50 a year um, that he funded as Chancellor was consistent with what had happened in the last decade. Well, the previous decade was austerity. So what's he judging it against, Harry? Yeah, there was a bit of a, a quibble on this. And actually, I think number 10 need to get their, their their sort of line straight on this because at the same time as saying actually it was all in line with um, with, with previous administrations, that's, that doesn't look quite true from the from the actual figures. The IFS and the Labour Party both saying tonight that actually there's somewhere between a 40% reduction in capital spending without getting too technical on um, on the different types of, of government spending. But on, on specific, particularly on capital spending for school refurbishments, there is a 40 to 50% decline in the last 10 years. And who has been in power for the last 13 years? It's, it's the Tories. And I think it just sort of feeds into a bit of a narrative that's starting to really take hold, especially amongst Tory MPs this summer. You know, Gillian Keegan herself was... She said she was delayed from going on holiday because of strike action, which she had to sort out. Then this all kicked off. And then she managed to get a couple of days away at the end of the summer where she got stuck coming back to rush and back to deal with this problem because all the flights were grounded. And there's just a sort of sense that nothing is really working in this country at the moment. And if, if MPs are picking up on that, my God, the public are, are there already. And really, once that sort, of, that sort of narrative takes hold, that sort of gloom kicks in, it, even amongst the sort of government ministers then really you do get into a bit of a sort of doom loop and a, and a sort of spiral of decline where it's pretty clear the government have lost the benefit of the doubt on, on a large amount of things. The, you know, the fact is that it's not every day that an that a, that a interview that is, you know, that a sort of comments after an interview are broadcast. They do happen, it does happen before. But I think, frankly, the sort of complacency that, that Keegan was showing just really sort of jarred with what a lot of people are feeling about this country, which is basically everything seems a bit broken and they can say all they like about the fact that it's town halls and councils that are responsible for the upkeep of schools, but you're the education secretary. And, you know, on that interview with Sophie Ridge earlier tonight, she was, would she apologise? No, she wouldn't. Then she did. Then she was saying it wasn't her responsibility. Then she said she took full responsibility. And you just think this is getting really messy now. And I think whatever the government say, there's a sort of growing feeling amongst a lot of voters that the polls are showing that, you know, they've had their chance. Time to let someone else have a go. Clear the stage because this ain't working. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I think she was making two points, probably. One, this has been going on yeah. since the mid-1990s. Why is this all on me? It was a difficult decision. Um, you know, that was, that was one part of it. Secondly, she suggested her department was really stepping in doing local council's work, you know, trying to get the mitigations in place, trying to get the porter cabins, and they're not getting thanked for that side of the role. So that's, that's what she was doing. Yeah, I think Sophie was pointing out that she was, or the last seven Conservative... Uh, seven education secretaries have been Conservatives. So, you know, who do you look back and blame? That sort of takes us to the, the reshuffle that we've seen with Labour. 
um, you know, leaving some key positions or see some key people in post um, Pippa, but moving Angela Rayner. You're, what's the significance of all of this for you? Well, I mean, the top the top tier of uh, the shadow cabinet, Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet. So, you know, the senior jobs, Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor, and uh, home, health, education, and energy all stayed put, and that had been fairly widely expected. Um, the big question for Starmer was what he was going to do about Angela Rayner. You remember that reshuffle back in May 2021, following the Harrogate by-election, which was completely chaotic, um, where Rayner was threatened with demotion and then ended up winning um, a, a promotion and indeed uh, several other job titles as well. Obviously, they were keen to avoid that and made sure that, um, that she was happy with what she got. I was told she was offered levelling up. It wasn't something she asked for. But she was very keen to hang on to strategic responsibility for the future of work stuff that Labour is coming up with. And of course, she has quite openly said in the past that she would expect Keir Starmer to make her his deputy prime minister should he become um, should he become prime minister and make it to number 10. Their relationship is definitely better than it has been in the past, although they do represent increasingly different wings of the party. And one of the really overwhelming um, the sort of obvious takeaways from this shadow cabinet reshuffle was the number of Blairites. Uh, that seemed to be moved into senior positions, people that were that served uh, as ministers under Blair and Brown, um, and indeed were special advisors, including some really key Blair um, Blair acolytes now in very senior positions. As uh, and, and a feeling amongst the soft left in the party that actually the the Labour Party has moved uh, the, the right of the Labour Party is in is in the ascendancy. Um, they see that as essential to uh, to win. The next election. But when you speak to Labour aides tonight, they, they stress that what it was all about for them was experience, not just experience of winning elections, but also experience of running governments. And of course, what all those people have in common, whether they served under Blair or indeed Brown, was that they both have the political experience of um, doing well at the ballot box, but crucially, the experience of running departments and, um, and sort of, you know, taking the country on after an extremely difficult time, as Harry has just set out. Yeah, very, very interesting. And, you know, is that idea of bring back the Blairites the most scary part of this for the Conservatives, Harry? Because we saw the success from 1997 after 18 years of Tory rule. You know, the similarities were all there for some people. I don't think it's uh, scary, I think, is the wrong word. At the end of the day, most people you know, would like the country to be run you know, from the centre ground, and that, that battle is always where the centre ground is. Let's not forget where Labour are coming from. They spent five years on the lunatic fringe of British politics under Jeremy Corbyn. So tacking back to where they once won from is, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's scary for the country. I think that's probably, that's probably a, a good thing. Look, I think you could look at these, this reshuffle alongside the last one as well, where people like where Streeting and Bridget Phillipson were moved up. This seems to be the sort of next phase of it. And it's about, you know, this is the team that like Keir Starmer says is going to stand, you know, be the ones that walk up Whitehall, hopefully for him next um, next year, next May, next October, whenever it may be. Uh, and it's about, you know, A, a team that could actually do those jobs and B, a team that can actually win the election to get them into there. So, yeah, as, as Pippa said, you've got some very battle-hardened people, Patrick McFadden, Tony Blair's former pl uh, political secretary, former minister himself, Hilary Benn, not necessarily, you know, obviously by birth, not, a, not of the right of the party, but certainly a, a sort of sensible, respected figure perhaps a little bit too on the second referendum Remainy side for for some yeah. people but um definitely a sort of a, a sort of labor the closest labor really have to a stalwart these days and there aren't many of them in the party uh, and you've got to look at yeah who went down Lisa Nandy someone who's of the soft left someone who's been accused rightly or wrongly of not necessarily being uber loyal to Starmer Someone like John Ashworth, who's been moved into a sort of more of a tack, tack dog role, but again of the soft left, gets demoted. So look, the direction of travel is there. The right people for, for Keir Starmer are squealing. It's momentum, the Jeremy Corbyn supporters group that are coming out and slagging this off tonight. And actually, you know, I think if you look at the people they've, in those jobs, there's a mixture of, uh, uh, of sensible middle of the ground, middle of the road politics. And there's also that element of experience. So the two of those things, I think, actually go together to make the Labour Party a lot less scary um, to, to anyone, let alone, uh, oh yeah, I don't know, only momentum seems to be whining. OK, very good. Anyway, May or October, uh, you've been warned, definitely. Uh, see you in just a moment. Plenty more still to come, including why summer ain't over yet, according to the Metro, just as schools return, of course.
hello again. You're watching the press preview, joined once again by the political editor of The Guardian, Prepper Krura, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Welcome back to both of you. Um, to the FT, Pippa, uh, the news from Northern Ireland. The top police officer there has resigned after uh, you know, a, a couple of you know, serious incidents, one might say. Yes, the news that Simon Byrne, the chief constable of uh, PSNI, uh, stood down today after an emergency meeting. Um, and he's really, there's been a, a series, a litany of, of, um, of difficult situations that he's presided over in recent months. There was the, obviously, the, the hugely serious issue of the data breach of personal information of about 10,000 officers and support staff, which is mentioned there in the FT. Um, but the, there's a more sort of, and then last week, the Belfast High Court ruled that the force unlawfully um, dismissed two, or disciplined two junior officers to placate Sinn Féin. And this is all set against the backdrop of an ongoing row um, on the perceived differences in how Republican and loyalist gatherings were policed during the pandemic when the rule of six was in place. Um, and Byrne had originally said that he wouldn't resign following the, the emergency meeting of the policing board last week um, and indicated he was considering an appeal against the ruling. But I think the, the conclusion was um, uh, that, that his statements were, were met with anger by the police federation in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, the vice chair of the board said that that federation statement was quite significant in his decision to change his mind and to quit. Um, and he did a press conference earlier in which he said that the welfare of the force was always at the top of his mind. Um, really, it's, it's yet another example of individuals running police forces becoming a distraction, um, their leadership coming into question. We've seen it with the Met Police as well, obviously, in recent times with Cresta Dick, and ultimately coming to the conclusion that there's no other option really for the continuation of the force, particularly in such a sensitive area for policing as Northern Ireland. Uh, there's no, no other option really than to stand down and let somebody pick up the reins. OK, um, we move on to the weather, because we're Brits and we like talking about it. It's inside the metro. Uh, summer ain't over yet. It's felt like it's been over for a long time, hasn't it? Let's be honest about it. Anyway, 32 degrees, just as schools return, it's always the way. Yeah, couldn't quite believe it when... I actually woke up this morning and I looked out the window. I woke up quite early and it was very misty. And so I thought, oh, you know, typical back-to-school weather. Uh, I'll, put on a, I'll put on a sort of a, a thick suit... And I got to work, <laughs> by the time I got to work, I was cursing myself for wondering why I ditched the linen. Um, yeah, a typical, after a complete washout summer. Um, I feel sorry for the kids. It basically seems to have been raining ever since they broke up for, for school holidays. It was hot before, it then rained for six weeks, and now it's going to be hot for a week or week or so afterwards. But um, yeah. typical, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I want them to change the uh, timing of the summer holidays, actually, to be a little bit more like Scotland, to be honest with you. Um, just a very quick look as well while we're leaving. Same page in the metro, actually. The 70,000 who are be beginning the great trek home as Burning Man mud dries out. It's been a slow process. They talked about how dangerous it's been. Um, extraordinary uh, extreme rain there. We've seen it in Spain as well. Forecast for a red alert for rainfall in central Greece too. So, you know, it's still all... Um, well, it's hard to predict, let's put it that way.